On this Thursday night, the forecast on food costs. After soaring prices in 2023, peanut butter has gone astronomically out of sight. A look at what most Canadians can expect next year, plus what people in the north are forced to pay. I don't know how other families get to go through that. Ottawa's plan to cap oil and gas emissions, what's promised and who's not buying it. There's no question that if they continue on this path, it will end up with court. Serving up some justice. One unruly customer got a taste of her own burrito in court. Plus, standing her ground. If it is offensive to you, that is unfortunate. The flood of support for a global news reporter who refused to be body shamed. Global National with Donna Friesen. Good evening and thanks for joining us. Some relief may be around the corner for Canadians dealing with sticker shock at the grocery store. The latest report on food prices forecasts they will keep rising in 2024, but at a slower pace than this year. A family of four can expect to pay nearly $16,300 for food next year. That's about $700 more than in 2023. The grocery industry has been under intense pressure to answer for record high profits. As Heidi Petrachuk reports, it could force chains to entice shoppers with more competitive prices. Canada's food price report says the squeeze on food budgets showed at checkouts. From April to the end of September, people were spending less on food, like a lot less. A family of four spent almost $700 less than expected, even with food price increases, which in Prince Edward Island and Quebec jumped the most in the country by 6.7%. Olive oil is an unbelievable price. All the green stuff is... Uh very high prices. Peanut butter has gone astronomically out of sight. Pasta that used to be 99 cents for a 900 gram bag is now 229 for an 800 gram bag. Higher costs bringing more people to this community food program. Between July and October this year, the number of meals that we served here increased by 50%. Food banks struggling to meet increasing demand. The numbers keep going up and they show no signs of abating. The report predicts food prices will still increase next year, although not as much, except bakery items, vegetables and meat, which could jump up between 5 and 7%. Some companies should be having lower prices to attract attention, but I don't see it. The report's project lead says that might still happen. We're expecting the end of the food inflation storm uh, and Perhaps, and that's really the, the good news, we do believe that we could see some price wars here and there. He predicts the major grocers will soon offer more incentives to lure shoppers from other big retailers and discount stores. This report also predicts energy costs and inflation will likely be factors in food pricing in 2024, along with climate change and the effects of extreme weather on crops around the world, as Canadians continue to try to manage their household budgets, which are already tight. Heidi Petrachik, Global News, Halifax. And a little later, Jeff Semple looks at the struggle Indigenous families face putting food on the table and a call for a national strategy to address food insecurity in Canada's north. But first, a long-awaited federal plan to cap emissions from Canada's oil and gas industry is out. It is a national cap and trade system the government and supporters say will be critical to meet Canada's climate targets. Oil and gas is the largest emitting sector in Canada. And unlike almost every other sector of our economy, pollution from the oil and gas sector is still going up. A lot of details still have to be negotiated, but it's already intensifying the fight between Ottawa and the country's biggest oil-producing provinces, especially Alberta, over how to reduce emissions. As David Aiken explains, Alberta's premier is already vowing to fight back. Well, Donna, the Trudeau government says its cap-and-trade system means it can both cut emissions and keep Canada as one of the world's top oil producers. This federal government's focus on decarbonizing Canada's oil and gas sector is both a plan to protect the planet for future generations and to enhance the short and long-term competitiveness of the industry. The plan would see oil and gas emissions capped at so many megatons per year. Each industry player would be given credits they'd use for every ton of emissions released. Those that invest in decarbonizing technologies fastest would not need all their credits and could sell any leftover to those moving slower. 
Over time, the cap gets smaller, the emission credits get more expensive, and that forces everyone in the industry to cut. This isn't going to work. Alberta's not going to accept it. In fact, we're going to fight it every step of the way. From so Dubai, where she's at the COP28 conference, Alberta's premier said cap and trade is Ottawa's attempt to cut oil production. It's clearly a production cap. And that's what we've thought all along as they've been proposing. This is why we've been fighting against it so hard. The premier's wrong. Randy Boissonneau is the only Albertan in Trudeau's cabinet. This is about a cap on pollution and emissions, not a cap on production. Production levels are predicted to go up. But Smith and Saskatchewan's Premier Scott Moe say it is not needed, that their oil and gas industries are already on a path to get to net zero by 2050. They are, are taking a direct hit on our industry and they're taking a direct hit on Alberta and it's unacceptable. I can tell you what we're trying to do with the most innovative sector in this country, which is the oil and gas sector, which is get to the greenest barrel of oil on the planet. Because the greenest barrel of oil on the planet is the one that the world's going to want first and most. There will be lots of time and possibly an entire federal election to hash this all out. It was just a draft framework that was released today. Draft regulations will come out in 2024, finalized in 2025, with the whole system coming online in 2026. Donna. Okay, David Aiken in Ottawa, thanks. Canada produces a lot of oil and production is on the rise. It's predicted to jump by 10% next year and reach an all-time high. That's why some environmental groups say the government's plan to cap emissions won't act fast enough. Eric Sorensen looks at how this cap and trade proposal has landed in the oil patch. From their Calgary office towers, the response in Canada's oil industry was swift and blunt. Ottawa's emissions target is effectively a cap on production. The Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers says Ottawa risks curtailing the energy Canadians rely on, along with jobs and government revenues. The Oil Sands Consortium Pathway Alliance states, we still need a greater understanding of how the cap integrates with other policies to support our emission reduction investments. The Calgary Chamber of Commerce says it's an economic blow for Alberta and the country. We need investor certainty, and right now this, this cap as presented is anything but providing uncertainty to industry across the board. It is that uncertainty around so many new policies that worries the industry. A carbon tax, carbon capture and storage, proposed methane regulations, and now an emissions cap and trade regime. It's really complicated. We don't have draft regulations yet, and it's going to take some time. So companies may decide that they don't want to invest, waiting for all those answers which effectively would curtail production. But others say Ottawa's emissions targets are largely aligned with the industry's own commitments. I would really characterize this emissions cap as a policy that is designed to hold industry to account to commitments that they have made for emissions reductions. And while environmental groups believe Ottawa could have gone further and faster, they are on balance pleased. It's really great to see this new cap policy, emissions cap policy, uh, take the next step towards becoming reality and becoming implemented to try and bend the curve on this uh, on the emissions from this sector. Some say it will all depend on how it works. Can Ottawa's technology fund be set up to help the emitters ultimately meet their targets? Investment in technology projects is a must and you have to make sure you invest the dollars into the people with the emissions to reduce those emissions. It will take years to see if the right balance is struck to reduce emissions to meet Canada's targets while maintaining an industry that is a linchpin in the Canadian economy. Eric Sorensen, Global News, Toronto. International students studying in Canada will face new hurdles. Financial requirements for them will double next year to keep up with the cost of living. Immigration Minister Mark Miller says those wanting to study in Canada will need to prove they have over $20,000 in their bank account on top of the cost of tuition. It would be a mistake to blame international students for the housing crisis, but it'd also be a mistake to invite them to come to Canada with no support including how to put a roof over their heads. There are 900,000 foreign students in Canada on student visas, and there have been calls to limit the number of future visas because many post-secondary students, both Canadian and international, are having trouble finding and paying for housing. Two months into Israel's war on Hamas, there is a somber mood in the country. More than 100 hostages taken in that attack by Hamas on October 7th are still in captivity. And the country's defense minister predicts the fight in Gaza could go on for two more months. 
There are fierce battles across Gaza now, including in the south, where people had been told there would be safe zones. There are none. The health infrastructure is on its knees. It's, it's almost collapsing. That is what the, the reality is. It's almost collapsing. Tens of thousands of people are streaming into Rafah, as far south as they can get. But there are reports of Israeli airstrikes there too. Gaza's health ministry, run by Hamas, says the death toll has now surpassed 17,000. Israel insists it is targeting Hamas. It claims rockets were fired from inside humanitarian zones, showing satellite imagery it says is proof. The IDF also raided a compound in Jabalia, Gaza's largest refugee camp overnight, saying it found a training center and weapons cache. The American president, Joe Biden, called Israel's prime minister again today. The White House says Biden stressed the critical need to protect civilians in Gaza and said that more assistance is urgently needed. A White House spokesperson says discussions are happening on trying to get another humanitarian pause in fighting, but there is no deal. One of Israel's gates into Gaza could reopen, though, and that offers a tiny glimmer of hope. Danielle Hamamjan is in Jerusalem tonight. Danielle. Donna, negotiations are underway to open a second crossing into Gaza. This is the Karem Shalom crossing in the south. It was, prior to the war, the main cargo route into the Gaza Strip. And according to a UN official, negotiations are promising. And this, of course, would be a huge boost to the humanitarian operation on the ground. If you ask the UN aid chief, He'll say you can hardly even call it a humanitarian operation anymore. That's how dire the situation is on the ground. Now, still on the topic of the United Nations, now on the diplomatic front, tensions have reached a new high. The Israeli foreign minister today called for the resignation of the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres, saying that his tenure as head of the world body was a danger to world peace. Some pretty strong language there. This is in reaction to a rare move by Guterres. He invoked Article 99 of the UN Charter, which formally uh, warns the Security Council of a global threat uh, from Israel's war on Hamas, something that was backed by the EU foreign chief today. Uh, not at all how Israel sees it. In fact, the uh, Israeli foreign minister today on social media said that calling for a ceasefire and invoking Article 99 constitute support for Hamas. Donna. All right, Danielle Hamamjan in Jerusalem tonight. Thank you. Inflation in Canada's north coming up. How Indigenous communities are bearing the brunt of food insecurity. Food insecurity, not having enough to eat, is on the rise in Canada. Stats Canada says about one in five Canadian families reported experiencing food insecurity last year. Among Indigenous families, it's higher than that. Now a pediatrician with a personal connection to the North is raising concerns about the consequences of food insecurity on Indigenous children. Jeff Semple has her story. Dr. Anna Banerjee thought food prices were high in her home city of Toronto. Then she went grocery shopping in the north. $16, that's really expensive. Record high inflation has sent food prices soaring across the country, but nowhere more than Canada's northernmost communities, many inaccessible by road. The pediatrician says Indigenous children are paying the heaviest price. Indigenous children in these communities uh, do not have enough food to eat. Banerjee published a paper in the PLOS Global Public Health Journal highlighting the consequences of food insecurity for Indigenous youth. The data shows Indigenous communities are twice as likely to face shortages of food. In one Inuit community in northern Quebec, the study found food insecure children were around two centimeters shorter than other Canadian kids. It's not acceptable, really, in a country as rich as Canada. For Banerjee, the issue is personal. She's visited the Arctic more than 50 times, conducting research in pediatric clinics. Then in 2004, Banerjee was asked if she would adopt an Inuit baby. He was just a wonderful kid. Her son, Nathan, grew up in Toronto. They often visited his birth mother and foster family in their northern community of Clyde River. But in 2018, at the age of 14, Nathan died by suicide. I'm still struggling with it. 
To mark the fifth anniversary of his death, Banerjee traveled to Clyde River last month, where Nathan's family is now struggling to afford food. $1.97 in Ottawa. Nathan's former foster mother points to a single can of soup on sale for $11.49, more than 10 times the price in Toronto. I know what it's like. We've been hungry, but uh, yeah, getting emotional. She's a widow who shares a home with three of her children and four grandchildren. Yeah, I don't know how other families get to go through that. Especially for the small communities and single parents. Yeah, it's really hard. Banerjee is calling for a national strategy to address food insecurity in the North. We've got children who are starving in this country. How is that reconciliation? We have to get beyond the rhetoric and, and make some real substantial changes. Jeff Semple, Global News, Toronto. The Assembly of First Nations has a new national chief. Cindy Woodhouse was elected after six rounds of voting. To Canada and to Canadians, we need your support. You have to work with First Nations people in a good way. If, if you don't listen to our people, you don't listen to our chiefs, you don't answer them then there's problems. And so to Canada, we're, we're, we're coming for you. <laughs> Woodhouse is from Manitoba, where she was the FN regional chief. She played a key role in the $23 billion child welfare settlement, and she's promised to bring stability to the AFN, which is the largest Indigenous advocacy organization in Canada. Still ahead, does the punishment fit the crime for this burrito bowl thrower? We all lose our cool from time to time, but some people take it to the next level. A woman in Ohio who hurled a burrito bowl at a Chipotle worker will soon learn what it's like to be on the other side of the counter. That episode got 39-year-old Rosemary Hain convicted of assault. She agreed to a reduced sentence of 30 days in jail if she works 20 hours a week for two months at a fast food restaurant. And it does not have to be a Chipotle. How do you spell justice? Well, we all mess up our words sometimes too, and now the most mispronounced words of 2023 are out, compiled by the online language learning company Babbel. SZA, she's one of Spotify's top 10 most streamed artists of 2023. That's SZA. Most people have trouble with Killian Murphy. He's the actor who starred in Christopher Nolan's Oppenheimer. And there's Samophile. Try using that one in a sentence. It's the winning word on this year's Scripps National Spelling Bee. And can you say Choupette? Of course you can. It's the name of fashion designer Karl Lagerfeld's cat. Next, a Global News reporter opens up about her viral clapback to a viewer's vicious email. Having a job on TV puts you in the public eye, and those of us who do it get all kinds of feedback from viewers. The hair, the clothes, the way we speak, all of it is scrutinized, especially if you're a woman. And the comments, well, they can range from good, bad, to downright ugly. Leslie Horton from Global Calgary knows all about that. Uh, just going to respond to an email that I just got uh, saying congratulations on your pregnancy. If you're going to wear old bus driver pants, you have to expect emails like this. So thanks for that. Um, no, I'm not pregnant. I actually lost my uterus to cancer last year. And um, this is what women of my age look like. So if it is offensive to you, that is unfortunate. Think about the emails that you send. And Leslie Horton is with me now. Leslie, I know you've worked at Global Calgary for, I think, 26 years. You've probably heard a lot of things for viewers, from viewers over the years. What made you take on this one? Well, I had heard from this man uh, for the past few years, Donna. Uh, he was not a stranger to me in the viewer email nasty department. Uh, but when this one came in, it just uh, hit a little bit differently. I had a bit of a visceral reaction, but I read it. I, I put it aside. I went on to do my uh, traffic hit. I was getting ready to go, and these words just came out of my mouth. They came out on a cellular level. I didn't know I was going to respond. I didn't plan on the words I was using to respond. They just came out, and afterwards, I thought, well, apparently I hit my line of saying, you may not speak to me that way. Yeah, it sounds like you just really couldn't take it anymore. I know the clip has gone viral. What are you hearing from people? 
99% of the comments are very positive, Donna. I, I, I'm hearing from people that say, you look like that, you shouldn't be on TV. You look like you weigh 200 pounds, and when's that baby popping out? It's not. No uterus. But I have heard a majority of people saying, uh, thank you for speaking out. Thank you for... Uh, putting that conversation out there so that we can have really maybe a discussion about how we're treating each other and a discussion about mm -hmm. lashing out at other folks and what's your intention when you're sending those emails the intention of this one was to shame hurt humiliate and embarrass me but i get to choose how i feel so when i put that line up i didn't feel any of those things i just felt like no you may not i hope you're feeling supported leslie you know i think the world is actually full of kind people What's your takeaway from this? The world is full of kind people. There's a lot of kind people out there. There's a, the world also has some folks who really just want to hurt and to lash out and perhaps it makes them feel elevated. It takes the conversation nowhere. Uh, the, it, there's, it's nonsense. There's no need for it. If you feel like you need to hurt somebody and lash out at a, at a, a, a Calgary mom on TV, then maybe have a Snickers. Take a look at yourself and just calm down. Go outside. Pet a dog. <laughs> Leslie Horton in Calgary. Thank you for taking time with us. Thanks, Donna. And that is Global National for this Thursday. I'm Donna Friesen. Hanukkah, the Jewish festival of light, begins at sundown tonight. This year, in the shadow of war, the celebrations are muted. In some places, they've even been cancelled. In Israel, families and supporters of the 138 people still being held hostage in Gaza gathered for a candle lighting ceremony. Hanukkah is meant to celebrate the triumph of lightness over darkness and is usually a joyous time. Not so much this year. Thanks for watching. Neetu Garcha will be at the anchor desk tomorrow, and I will see you again next week. Bye bye.